Okay, so core pleth mapping. Koro means area in Greek and pleth means number or many. So we're talking about putting uh, numbers in area. And usually with maps that means we're putting color along with those areas. Um, I'm going to talk about two major problems. One is called the modified aerial unit problem. And the other is called um, normalization. And normalization you might be familiar with in terms of other kind of statistical problems. So I've got four uh, people here. And let's say that these are two reporting areas. Well, we might kind of, that might make sense to us. We might say, yep, well, of course, there would be two people in each half of that um, study area if those are our two reporting areas. And if we went on the ground and kind of looked and saw like where those people were actually living, it might be true, right? We might see, yep, in this area, one person lives there, another area, one person lives there, and it's two and two. Cool. Well, that seems like everything's happy, right? But let's say we have our study area shape file, and here are our reporting areas, and that's reporting area one. We might also, given that, think that we could just draw the boxes the other way and say, well, this is half and this is half, so that should be two and two as well, right? Well, the only issue with that is, given our previous example, that wouldn't work, right? The actual phenomenon on the ground, if we did two and two this way, drawing the line across, then yeah, of course it's two and two. But in this way, it's kind of three and one. So by modifying that area, we've kind of changed how um, each of the reporting areas kind of is symbolized. And it's the, it still has the same sum. It's still four. So we might think, well, geez, that's fine because the sum is the same between them. So, so long as we know what our reporting areas are, it should be fine. Well, when we assign a value for a space like this, we're kind of assuming some kind of homogeneity just innately. When I said four right here, you had no problem understanding probably that this was two and this was two. And likewise, you should have been able to kind of make the jump and say, well, vertically it could have been two and two when they're divided this way instead of this way. And I just showed you how that's not always true. So the problem with putting a number kind of in a box on the ground or in any kind of shape is that that number is generalizing, right? People live in exact points in discrete data, but we have to, we have to collect data in um, kind of reporting areas or regions. So we've got this problem where we report things by areas, we're generalizing, but what is the modified aerial unit problem? It seems like Yes, we modified the area, and we got a 1 and a 3 and a 2 and a 2, but it still adds up to 4, so why does it matter? Let's say we have the study area again, same deal, um, and we, our whole study area has two people who are employed and two people who are not employed, and the employed people are represented by green. Well, we could divide this area up and say, well, our reporting area 1 has 0% employed, and our reporting area 2 has 2 out of 3, 66% employed. Or we could have reported this data another way. What if for some reason it was our reporting areas were in this shape? Then we would have, aha, reporting area 1 is 100% employed, and reporting area 2 is 33% employed. The point is, is that you're vastly changing kind of the representation of the ratio just by how you draw, right? In this case, our entire study area, if we took some kind of average of these ratios, is going to be much higher than if we took an average of these ratios. And even though those are different, neither one would equal what we know the average of the whole study area to be, or the whole kind of percentage, rather. So, what do you do? Well, the key is to just be conscious of it because we never receive data um, usually with exact points like this. So most, time it, no, most times it comes um, in a polygon-style shapefile where we just have the numbers and the shapes. So your job is to recognize who made the shapes, why do you think they made them, and the sizes that they did. Um, are the sizes following the pattern on the landscape? that kind of thing. We need to figure out how do we kind of make sure that this modified aerial unit problem doesn't get out of control because you can see that it, it's pretty easy 
um, ahem, gerrymandering in order to redistrict or redraw these kind of boundaries to create very different numbers that you could pretty easily just paint one or the other, right? Well, hopefully one of the best lines of defense against that problem is that whatever the reporting areas are, are, are fairly honest about the, the phenomenon that they're trying to represent. So population density, for instance, usually we have areas that report um, high density areas versus low density. That's a pretty basic way to do it, right? So that's great. What if we have somebody who's done a responsible job and they said, yep, this area is more dense than this area. Um, they're using other information to kind of verify that. And we were, okay, that's great. Maybe we should represent this on a map somehow. Well, we might decide, yep, the raw count values, there are six people or maybe six towns or whatever it is, six in the rural area and there are five in the urban area. If we were to just toss color on that, we're going to come up with a problem, actually. And that makes it such that this raw count almost will make the map feel denser in the rural area than it is in the urban area. And so this brings up the second problem, which is um, we, we need to normalize our data in order to give it a kind of proper symbolization on the map. So this linear color scheme, red means more, light, orange is less. 6 and 5, the raw counts, they are quote-unquote being truthful. There are 6 um, people in the rural area and there are 5 in the urban, but it just doesn't feel right. So one way we can kind of deal with that is to instead of represent raw counts, we can represent a ratio, right? You'll notice that these 6 people are more spread out. So let's pretend that this is 1 mile and this is 1 mile. And likewise, this is a mile and that's a mile. So we've got three square miles here and one square mile there. We could quantify that and say, well, we've got kind of two people per square mile in this range, and we've got five people per square mile in this kind of closer demarcation. And if we take those spatial density values and add color to those instead of the raw values, then we get something that looks a little bit better and it actually represents um, the original data kind of more honestly than a raw count would. Okay, so that's the first major way to normalize something kind of by area representing a density. I hope you're ready. We're going to do um, two more examples and it gets a little bit more exciting. So I've stepped up the example now and we've got 25 people in the urban area and we've got 8 people in the um, rural area. So the other way to normalize is kind of simple in a spreadsheet. It's um, by percent. But I just want to show you what I mean when we kind of add geographic space to the problem. So let's just call this, yeah, here we go. Here's an attribute table. We're going to start to see them, so get used to it population here, we've got 8 in this shape file which relates to that record and 25 in this geography of the shape file which relates to that record. Let's also just say that in this case what we're interested in studying the urban phenomenon is very different than the rural phenomenon and what I mean is is you'll see in a moment the next attribute that we're going to look at actually does matter. Like this, this line isn't just arbitrary. It kind of represents a cultural or kind of pattern divide in human geography. There are different processes happening in an urban area than there are in a rural area. And it's worth us demarcating them because that's the whole point of the study is to kind of see what differences are happening in these regions um, as being distinct from each other. So let's add that to the attribute table. Right, so maybe our attribute table says type rural versus urban, and there's eight in one and, and 25 in the other. Cool. So now let's just say it has to deal with um, age demographics. Let's say that in the rural area there are four people for every eight people that are um, older. Maybe they're you know over 65 or something. And in the urban area, let's say there's five people for every 25 that are older as well. Now if we were to again just throw colors on the map the raw values we're looking at right now 5 seems like it's more than 4 which is true so the map would look 
kind of like there are more old people in an urban area, which there are always more old people in an urban area because there's just more people. But proportionately, over half of the people in the countryside in this particular example are old, whereas only 20% of the people are old in the urban area. So it's that relationship, that ratio that really matters. And it's up to you as a cartographer to know that that's what matters. And usually if you're dealing with just kind of raw core pleth maps like this, it's almost always a ratio that you're looking to symbolize. So instead of doing a raw count symbology get using this linear color scheme, we want to try to do a different symbology. And to do that, I want to calculate the percentage of each one and symbolize that instead. So to symbolize that, I'm going to say, use my field calculator and take my old column, divide it by my population column, multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. And my new shape, uh, my new attribute table will look like this, right? We've got old divided by pop times 100, so that'd be 0.5 times 100 is 50. 5 divided by 25 is 0.2 times 100 is 20. So we've got 50% and 20%. Um, and this percentage represents the amount of the, the population that is identified as old or greater than 65. So if we map these numbers, these kind of ratio numbers, right, um, which are being represented as a real number in this case, these ratio numbers kind of better represent the, the phenomenon, which is that a greater number, kind of proportionate number of people are actually older in this rural environment than they are in the city. The city tends to be a little younger, it seems, in this example. So those two major ways, normalized by density um, and area, or normalized by percent, are the two main takeaways I want you to have. Those are your tools. Um, how, do you, how you kind of manage the inherent error um, that you get when you use choropleth maps. I want to show you one more way and it's a little bit more um, kind of out there, but um, it's a definitely a good method that was developed um, in the early 1900s. So it's called desymmetric mapping. And desymmetric mapping is not really that complicated. Um, all it really has to do with is trying to use what we'd say is ancillary data, kind of data from the outside, to improve our reporting geographies. Um, to better represent kind of the areas that they're actually trying to represent. So let's say for instance that you know where um, a piece of water is, right? Well you know that people don't <laughs> generally live right on the water. So what if you just kind of erased that? You got rid of that from the, the entire shapefile. You could use, in QGIS you'd use the tool difference, right? And if you did a difference command the attributes would stay the same, but the shape, the actual shape of the geography would change for each geography in the shapefile. And this is pretty cool because now if we calculate area, we'll get almost half the area, which lets us know that, yeah, this city that apparently is sitting right on kind of this, um, this coastal area actually is way denser than we thought before. If people say desymmetric mapping, this is just one technique. This is kind of what we'd say is the binary way, right? Um, or Boolean. No, people do not live on the water. Yes, they live on land. The one problem with this is that, so we did a difference. What we'd end up with actually is, this is, this is not what we'd actually end up with, right? Because this is all the actual locations on the ground. Our values would look something a little bit more like this, right? Here's our new shapefile, population, no water. And it's what we call a multi-part shapefile. You've just created one, two, three different geographies, and they're only one record in the shapefile. We know that five people don't actually live on this little island. They all live on kind of the mainland here. But the computer program doesn't really know that. The shapefile has just been chopped. And so you have to, in the future, you'll learn how to, how to manage kind of these multi-part features. Um, but a multi-part feature is one, still one record in a shapefile. So that's asymmetric mapping. Um, just kind of be aware that you can alter your shapefile by another shapefile to make it more realistic.